Good. Welcome, everybody. Curtis, Brenda, Brenda, would you like to come up, please? I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> So the four-way test. Of the things we think and do first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Does it mean has an inspiration for us? Chiefs Hamlin regrets that she can't join us today. She said, quote unquote, she's up to her ear balls and working for hung against hunger. So good for her. I would like to share a, a poem. To, and the title of the poem is Practicing the Complex Yes. When you disagree with a friend, a stranger, or a foe, how do you reply but not say simply no? For no can stop the conversation or turn it into an argument or worse, the conversation that must go on as the river must, a friendship, a troubled nation. So may we practice the repertoire of complex yes. Yes. And in what you say, I see, yes. And at the same time, yes. And what if, yes, I hear you. And how, yes. And there's an old story. Yes, and there's an old song that goes. Yes, and as a child once told me. Yes, yes, tell me more. I want to understand. And then I want to tell you how it is for me. I don't believe we have any visiting Rotarians in Sumbai. Okay, well, let's introduce some guests. I think we've got a few. We have a speaker, but Mike will wait for the we'll wait. You can do a more formalized introduction of the speaker in a few moments. Um, Jenny. Ashley's still here, soon to be not a guest, very soon. Yeah, very soon. Welcome. Okay. All right, it's time for announcements. Do we have any announcements? There we go. What's the price? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so Tuesday, June 4th at 3 o'clock is going to be at the Boys and Girls Club, our Shoes That Fit program. We'll be giving 49 children new shoes. One of them is a size 16. Wow. I was totally surprised. I mean, I had to pull that thing out and look at it. It was like, <laughs> but anyhow, so we've got one that's at least a size 16. And then, of course, some is a little as this, you know. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I haven't had a huge amount of response at this point. I've had a few people tell me that they're able to come. If you're able to come, please do. Um, I would love to have you there. We're meeting at 3 o'clock at the Boys and Girls Club. Should be able to get started fitting the kids no later than 3.30, and it shouldn't take too terribly long since we've got 49 kids. So anyway, it's pretty darn exciting, and I know the Boys and Girls Club is thrilled that we're going to be able to do this. I have a favor to ask everyone. Um, who's on Facebook? Okay, I'm going to ask anybody on Facebook um, if they would like or comment on all the Porch Chef sponsor posts. I think if we go and say, you know, 100 people commented on your when, when we posted about your sponsorship, I think that would be a good message. So if everybody could do it themselves, if they're husband or wife, kids, I have a dog that has a Facebook site. So, <laughs> so if, if everybody would do that, that would be great. Okay. 
This is very quick, but for those of you that are doing road gateway rotary reads or someone who would like to, this is the book that we most recently chose. Supposedly we're going to be done with it in July, I think not. But anyway, it's our first foray in a novel. So anyone who is interested, please order the book. And I kind of think we'll call it our summer reading book. I, I can't see being done in July. Would you read the title? So that everybody can hear it. Oh, that's a good idea. Last time I was up here and showed a book. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's the love songs of Webb, W.E.B. Dubois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. And it's also in our e navigator. Eight hundred pages. Yeah, that's a big one. In the long book. Um, I bought it and I and I got it and I was like, oh my god, what I do. <laughs> So I'm reading. Um, Porch Fest is coming up, and we need I need one person to make a commitment to be there at about 9.30 or so to set up the uh, road closure signs. Uh, it's not a heavy lift, but I just need to make sure I have somebody there that's going to do that. i got to go around all the intersections, put up the detour sign and the road close ahead sign. So let me know if you can help with that. Thanks. Uh, Patrice Hamlin was going to be here today, but she couldn't make it, so I thought she'd be talking about this. But I'll do it for her. Uh, Shining a Light on Hunger, the fundraising event for the food bank, uh, June the 6th on at 2222 uh, Missouri Platte Road. I think it's a, a vineyard. Anyway, it's what? Vista 222. What did I say? Vista 222. That's the name of the place. Oh, it's Vista 222 at 222 Missouri Platte Road. Okay. With that, I think that's it. How about Mike? Would you like to come up and introduce our speaker and our guest? Yes, thank you. I'll print this out to my printer, like Benny Sack on it this morning. So, anyway, I've got it on my phone. It's in the newsletter. This is Tamara Martin, and she has worked with Josephine County for five and a half years now, starting as the fairgrounds director. Then she was asked to serve as interim director for the Christian County Parks Department. And then the idea came up of merging those two, and now her title is Recreation Department head. She is uh, uh, an official duty shifted to rec Recreation Director. She's been married for 21 years. Her husband is a Sergeant Major in the Army National Guard for 22 years. She has three children. Her son just graduated with Master of Science in Information Systems. Her oldest daughter is wrapping up her sophomore year in college with a degree in communications. And her youngest daughter, 13 years old, is a student at North Middle School. She is going to share the future of our Josephine County Parks with us and a master plan into the Josephine County Fairgrounds, which is the major importance of us. And she'll also be able to answer questions and share information about the, uh, the uh, use of the proceeds of the sale of the flying lark uh, and, uh, and how that will impact the future of the fair So with no further ado, I introduce Tamara Martin. Thank you. 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 Hello, everyone. It has been a few years since I've been to the group. I actually was sitting there thinking about it, and I was in, actually think it was pre-COVID the last time I was here. Uh, I actually like to preface thank you, Michael, by saying that, yeah, I've been with the county for five and a half years, and most of you have met me and have known me as the Bear Grounds manager. So when I come in and I start talking about a different position, people go, wait, what? <laughs> Um, I have been a recreation director now for about a year and a half. It's been since we've made that official merge. It's been quite a process for sure. The reason why, because the people ask me this quite a lot, is why, 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 why were you not busy enough? You know, I wasn't even here. Uh, and really what it comes down to is what's unique about the fairgrounds and the parks is that we are what they are considered an enterprise fund, an enterprise fund with the county. So we are a county department, but we are not funded by the county. Uh, we do not receive any funds from the general fund uh, on both of them. So everything that we do is self-funded. 
And so that's what makes both of us unique. And the interesting thing with merging the two departments is that while we're together, we're still very separate. Fairgrounds are a little bit different because fairgrounds are actually backed by state statute or managed by a fair board. And so they are a little different than an advisory committee. They're actually considered a governing board and have state laws to support their efforts. So we have a fair board. I also have our parks advisory board. And then we've broken it out into a variety of pieces. And I throw this up there just to kind of show that as we're making this merge, what this actually will look like. Yep. A very high priority for me is to get our administration staffs all in one space. Right now, I've been bouncing back and forth between the two offices, which I'm sure you can imagine is a bit complicated. People are like, where are you? I don't know. Okay. So parks. I just want to talk a little bit about the parks. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of conversations around our parks lately within our community, and our county parks are are a little bit different. And I wanted to talk about how, how they're different and what we are focusing on for our community. Our parks are generally on the outskirts of towns. Tom Pierce, Griffin, Lake Selmac, um, or just to kind of name a few. We also do a lot of boat rings, Chinook Park, Schroeder Park, and we're really around um, the recreational use of the river. Camping was a big part of what we offer as well. And so with our parks, because we are an enterprise fund, we do charge a day use fee. It's a parking day use fee for all of our parks. And what that money generates is, that is what we are funding back into our parks. That's what's paying our rangers payroll. That's what's buying the grass to seeds. That's what's making the investment back into our parks. This model has actually been really successful for us and we're really thrilled by the results. And once people realize what their $5 is going to, generally speaking, people are more than happy to support that part of SPAC. And so it has been a really uh, wonderful experience to kind of get involved. One of the pieces that we're looking at and looking forward to is how do we offer more recreation for our community? Where can we start bringing in the recreation aspect of the Parks and Recreation Department? Um, we've really been focusing on just the land management as well as general use. And so we're in this space right now. We're looking to get more involved in the community to start bringing the community events and different things that the community would like to see in our parks as well. Our most recent large improvement, if you have not been to Tom Pierce Park lately, we built a new play structure. It is an amazing play structure, three stories. It has inclusive play, and uh, that's what's really special about Tom Pierce. Tom Pierce is a very large park, and what's really neat about it is we've been able to take that west end of the park, and it's about family and playgrounds, and you can go out at any time when you see them running around playing and having a really great time. On the other end of the park, we have a really wonderful disc golf course. And they actually hold some regional tournaments down there. And I tell you what, they take this very seriously. I have no idea this golf was as big of a thing as it is. So yeah, that's been our most recent investment. Now we're working on some smaller projects. Um, Granite Hill Cemetery is actually a property that the Parks Department manages. I don't know if anyone knows that. But uh, we are looking towards uh, building the cleaning and columbarium walls and so that we can um, get all of that kind of back open to the public. We also just finished visualizing all of the uh, records and there's over a hundred years of them. So that was quite the project. We're pretty excited about it. We're also looking at bringing in electric charging car stations into our park locations. And that's something that we'll probably see in the course of the next few months coming into the parks. The, big, the next really large project that we have on my plate for the parks is actually Pierce Ripple Park. I don't know if everyone is familiar with where that's at. It's just down the lane, as Avro Lane is, uh, it's a boat ramp. It's actually owned by ODFW and we've managed it for many years. Started talking with ODFW about 
what we can do, it has a really beautiful trail system that has been completely overgrown and is inaccessible. And we want, after kind of going through, took a planning team down there, we would really like to renovate that park and create a park that is specifically designed for elementary and other veterans. We want to create an ADA veterans walk, build a shelter, create a campus site, and do all of these things to really bring some life and identity back into that park. And it's kind of been one of the forgotten small parks off the beaten path, but we believe that it has a lot of potential to really be something special. And so we're really excited about this project. We are still in the um, estimating budget stages of this, um, but we believe that by fall, we will have a, our plan completely done and be able to go out for grants. We have a couple of really great veterans groups that are thrilled and excited about this project and are gonna be helping us get those trails reopened for everybody as well. So we're, this is something that's gonna be coming for them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fairgrounds and we'll kind of shift gears. Um, I'm gonna tell you a lot of information today, just so you know, but I left a lot of time for you guys to answer questions, ask questions, so. Don't, don't worry. Fairgrounds master plan. Um, when I when I was hired five and a half years ago, I sat down with the fair board with the commissioners. I said, okay, what do you guys want me to do? And they said, what do you want to do? Okay, here we go. So one of the very first priorities for us at the fair board was actually the master plan. I had a fair board member by the name of Mark Coverstein, and some of you may know, he was adamant about the master plan and was very excited when I came in and I said, gosh, we really need a master plan. <laughs> so this was adopted back in 2020 and it was divided up in a way to be considered a working master plan that every um, every three years would be reevaluated. Re and be able to add, subtract, just knowing that everything would change. And so that's where we're at with our master plan. We have been focused on really the biggest piece, if you wanna switch, is changing our entry. Right now you enter the fairgrounds in from Redwood Avenue, very highlight actually. We would like to change our gate entry so that you actually enter from where you get. And when you come into the fairground, you actually walk into a park-like setting, which would be a nice generalized flat, beautiful lawn space that could um, also be a great spot for events. We really want to transform our fairgrounds. A healthy fairgrounds in the community is an absolute economic driver. And it can be through cultural events, uh, festivals, Anything that you can think of that requires a gathering to come together, the fairgrounds has the opportunity to support and serve. And that's really been a primary focus for the last few years as I've been trying to work on the fairgrounds. To get us to a space where when people think of the fairgrounds, they don't just think of cows. They don't think they have to have a farm to be a part of something that's happening in the fairgrounds. So we've been working really hard at bringing in a wide variety of users to the fairgrounds to make them feel welcome and to really know that the fairgrounds serves our entire community, not just portions of our community. And another really important piece of our fairgrounds is actually the emergency aspect um, of what we can offer our community in times of emergency. People come to us whether we put the call out or not. If there's a fire happening, I have horse trailers in my lot going, where do we go? Like this is something that people just come to us knowing that we are supposed to be a part of that solution. Right now with the current state of our fairgrounds, there's very little support that we can offer other than reassurance, directions, and a space sometimes for the animals to be while we help them find another spot for them, you know, for themselves. And so we are really lacking in what our fairgrounds can support and that is something that is very much a part of our master plan is that we want to make sure that no matter the situation, whether we're celebrating, whether we're supporting, whether we're providing services, that the fairgrounds is an actual place that people can come and find the services that they need. We're trying, we're just still a little bit shocked. But 
This last year, we had 562 events and activities on the fairgrounds. It's a lot. <laughs> uh, I have one part-time maintenance guy, 55 acres, a caretaker who's a volunteer, and then my office staff, we are all split between different departments. It's a very um, unique challenge out at the fairgrounds, but I gotta tell you what I have found to be so true with everyone that I've encountered in working with the fairgrounds, the dedication that people have to the fairgrounds and what it provides for the community is outstanding. I have never met volunteers who are so connected and so committed and so dedicated and so happy to tell me when things are going okay and when they <laughs> So it's a really a wonderful thing to see happen. Uh, the fairgrounds absolutely is growing and we're getting there. So we have kicked off a lot in our master plan already. Some of it's been is noticeable, some of it is not quite so much. It's not fun stuff like electrical. But we have built a 4,000 square foot outdoor ex exhibit, er, sorry, event areas for the gazebo. And uh, we are just getting ready to really kick that off this summer. We're really excited about that. This was actually funded through an ARCA grant. And it came out of the fact that once we entered into the COVID space, people needed someplace outside to be. The only space that we had outside just absolutely did not work um, for any sort of spreading out an event. So this was designed specifically for those events in mind. And so that as we move forward, we can offer more of that indoor outdoor type of space. If anybody has been on the fairgrounds, you may have seen a very old house, the host house. Uh, fair managers from the past have lived in that house. Uh, and it has been some real dire straits lately. So we received a grant from um, the state of Oregon, Business Oregon, and to really focus on some capital improvements on our fairgrounds, it's actually went out to all fairgrounds across the state. And we have renovated the exterior of the host house, new windows, all of the rotting wood, you know, and gave it a nice, beautiful paint job. Eventually, what we're hoping to do is actually turn it into an Airbnb or a space for small rentals. It has a beautiful background. It's just been really neglected over the past years. And so we'd like to get that back into shape so someone could have a small backyard wedding, things of those nature. The house is actually really personal and actually is very amazing inside. The other thing that we've been working on is the arena, the indoor arena from the 1950s. This is a beautiful arena. We love this arena. It is absolutely a staple of our fairgrounds and we want it to be for forevermore. Um, in the last five years, it's received a new roof. It's received new siding along the outside. We just finished the next stage, which was new lighting inside the arena, as well as um, some access for ADA, created some ADA seating, access points. And then we went under the bleachers. This is the not so fun part. But we re-secured everything underneath those bleachers. And that was really important because I gotta say, every time we had a rodeo or a circus or some pole, I was nervous. <laughs> so I'm really excited about this. We still have um, two more phases for this arena before we'll get there, including all in electrical as well as ADA restrooms. And so this is something that we've been really working. The other piece is we went and renovated all the restrooms in the buildings. Pavilion, floral, arts and crafts, and then our, our standalone bathrooms have all been upgraded as well to actually, I don't know how long anybody's been in the fairgrounds for a while, but when I got there, there were not doors on the bathrooms. I don't even know. Uh, we have stalls now. This is something we're really excited about. So, you know, we're we're really ready, moving towards the direction to serve the community. 2024, 69 days, anyone else is coming. <laughs> uh, we shifted three years ago to a free admission model, which, you know, a lot of people went, you're broke, you can't do that, what are you doing? Uh, really what it came down to is we just didn't have a lot of people coming to the fair. And so there's this conception within our community, we just got done with Botnik, Botnik's free. Everyone goes, they have an amazing time. The idea of having to come and pay for the fair, they just didn't understand 
why affair was different. And that was something that we really battled over the years. And actually the fair industry as a whole has been battling over the years. So we switched to the free, free fair admission. People pay for the concerts. And really it has vastly improved the attendance of our fair. In fact, that first year I had food vendors running out of food. We had lines. I was cleaning bathrooms. It was everything we could do to keep up on, on our side. And so we're just really excited about the direction of this and what this actually can mean. It just has revitalized the community's interest in what a fair can be. And so we're going to continue moving forward with the free fair admission. We uh, switched things up a little bit this year, decided to kind of really focus on the music. We're going to, our theme is dancing, dancing through a rock in the decades. And um, we have a 70s, 80s, 90s, and then the nows. I gotta tell you, if you follow anything along the lines right now, we have a Taylor Swift impersonator coming. Wow. I'm just saying. <laughs> so we're really focusing on, on being very interactive, and that's what's different between a fair and a festival. A fair is made up by our community participating, being in the fair, being in the competitions, all of the different things. And so everything that we do when we build our fair is how do we engage and get people to participate in what we're doing. Okay, so this is another reason why you guys asked me to come. I know that. I know. By and large, what does it mean? Why? I'll give you a little bit of background. So, the Fly and Mark is located on Fairgrounds property. And I mentioned earlier that the Fairgrounds is an enterprise fund that's actually supported by the state. So, Fairgrounds property is Fairgrounds property. And we have really, you know, I, because I've been here so long, I got that first phone call from Travis's team saying, hey, I have an idea. Portland, Portland Meadows is closing. Let's make Josephine County the back of our horse racing for Oregon. And so, you know, it's been a really interesting process to be here from the beginning to see it all the way through. Uh, we have had the lack up for sale for about a year. And the reason why is because really, truly inside, it's not very big for public spaces. While it looks huge from the outside, the ability to turn it into an event center just doesn't really work based on the layout, the floor plan, and the actual size of the space that's available. So we looked into this quite a bit. We had, I can't even tell you how many conversations I've had with people about the lot over the, the last year. Some amazing ideas, but unfortunately, because of this, the building itself and the design, because it was so specifically designed for its purpose, it just could never get quite the right group to come in because they would they knew, yeah, we're gonna come in, but we're gonna spend millions of dollars to renovate this space. So we're in a position now where we decided to go ahead and put it up for sale to see what, what the market would bear. Uh, talk to groups all over the United States. It's been a really interesting process. I've had lots of conversations, lots of industries, and it's been a pretty exciting time. Uh, but where we're at now is that our local church has put an offer in and the company is accepted. And what does this mean moving forward? I get asked this question a lot. I'm thrilled for the opportunity to be working with somebody local. They, there is a local connection. People understand that the fair is it's going to have an impact, but they're excited about the fair, what it can bring, right? And so it gives a little bit more of that hometown conversation and it allows um, a little bit of flexibility when we're talking about how can we share some of the areas instead of it being some big corporation enterprise coming in from another state that says, I don't care that it's soccer Saturday, <laughs> you know, get off my land. So there's there's a real benefit to having somebody local come in. Um, the proceeds. So what we're working towards right now is how do we how do we take the the actual money being received and make it work for the long game. And that's really what the fairgrounds is all about, the long game. It's been here over 100 years, plan on being here another 100. Um, and so what we have as a team collaboratively come down to is creating what they call a permanent fund. And this permanent fund is where the proceeds from that sale will sit. 
And the interest that is earned off of that principle is what will be accessible to the fairgrounds to invest back into the property. And I think that's the really important piece of that because 10 years from now, if it's 9 million, that 9 million will still be there and will still be feeding into the fairgrounds. So if you can estimate $400,000 annually, that could potentially be coming to the fairgrounds. Now I have a resource for matching grants, for bonding for bigger project, for whatever may come. So now that money not only is just generating interest that can be invested into the fairgrounds, but it also is allowing me the opportunity to multiply it. And this is what I'm excited about for the fairgrounds because the biggest challenge that we've had in the five and a half years that I've been having long before I got here is financing. Money has been a real problem. And so this is going to be something that is gonna allow us to invest into the fairgrounds without having to go to the taxpayers, without having to you know, create other hardships on the community. And so when I talk a little bit about our master plan, that's where that money is going to be invested back. So I'm going to open it up for questions because I know you have them and I do my very best to answer. And I was told to walk around with a microphone. Anybody? Snap it. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'll start this. I remember hearing some conversations. I'm not sure how much officially y'all officially were in a meeting from more than five years ago about relocating the fairgrounds, using that kind of prime gap on type space for something, you know, housing to bring more, uh, yeah, and moving the fairgrounds out to the county. It sounds like there's all these improvements, and maybe that's off the table, but I'm wondering is that still a discussion at all? So that was a discussion, especially back when um, the fairgrounds was removed from the general fund. Is how do we get them? Like they couldn't keep them. It sounds like you know it's getting really creative. Uh, there was the fair board at the time. A community group came together and said, "Absolutely, we do not want to sell the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds is incredibly important to our community, to our traditions, and we'll figure out how to make it work." And that's really what the last probably eight years have been about you know how do we become important to the community and really justify everything that we're here to do for the community. So as far as down the road in the future, it has been removed from the immediate space. Um, I don't foresee that happening. I'm just curious, how does the horse, horse racing season work? Are you charged that also or is it just a, a contract with others? How's that work? So we have two official horse racing groups. We have one which is considered a fair meet. Um, one is considered a commercial meet. And really what it comes down to is the level of um, meets that they can have between the two. And uh, generally the type of horses that will be coming in for competitors are athletes. And so the larger the horses, that's where they're going to be going to compete for those winnings. Uh, we are not in charge of the horse racing. We do have a contract with the two individual groups, and they are in charge of you know uh, all of their operations in that sense. Um, our our piece of it is to kind of offer them the support of the fairgrounds and help them out in different ways that we can. Uh, generally speaking, they're pretty self-contained, and uh, we just do our best to support them and stand away. <laughs> Anybody else? Mine is part of me, isn't a question, but it's a statement. It's actually kind of funny. The time I was here today, I just went and met with Sierra this morning and was reviewing the different buildings out there. And that's something for you guys to think about. When we don't really have an event space, the fairgrounds is a fabulous event space. And I personally been looking at their brochure, seems like the buildings are very, very reasonable. I'm trying to get my OEP uh, convention in 2027 there. So kind of getting that going, but I just wanted to put a plug in. If you've got something that you need to do, you know, that that place is pretty good. We do actually have events that will range from a smallish baby shower that will be in one of our smaller buildings to large community events. You may know back at the East having their park show to the fairgrounds last year. They had such a great time that they're like, 
we work on that, you know, because we're designed to support events. We have the power, we have all of those things that you need for your food trucks, and we can help kind of guide and, and you know, help people build and grow. So it's been a lot of fun to kind of watch that grow and develop, but we do everything from private events to much, very large community events, not only to them. You actually have weddings there right now in the um is it just in that house or or, or in in one of the rooms or... so the most popular wedding building is actually the floral building and the reason why is because it could be split in half with a curtain and so generally people will set up a ceremony on one side and then set up a reception on the other and they go in they can find you know various spots the arena is a great picture spot. If you guys are ever taking pictures, we see lots of seniors out there taking pictures too. Um, and the, we also have some on the lawn, but primarily the floral building is the most common. I just had one there last weekend. So I'm probably showing my money to But a concern or a question more that I would like to ask you to show them more than I. Um, so if the church uh, is going to take over the flying mark, they're um, not taxed. So no revenue will then come in to the city, that's, or county, excuse me, um, because of that. Is that a factor that should be addressed? Or? So I'm not a tax expert, let me start by saying that. Um, I do know that there are some people, uh, some organizations that have, you know, tax deferments, all sorts of different tax things that go into, into it. And so um, was it a consideration, if you would have come to me last year in March and said, hey, let's put a church in there, I would have looked at you and said, absolutely not. <laughs> I have very big plans for this whole side of the programs that all surrounded entertainment and the ability to um, be an economic driver. Um, unfortunately, what we are seeing is a year later, and what I have is a very big joining on the fairgrounds with really no way to pay for it. And so I'm letting go of staff to try and pay for a building that's sitting in deep and is just deteriorating and you know just going down in value. And the longer it sits, the less we're going to get for it. And that's just unfortunate of where we're at. And as far as the tax, you know, it's there is a very aggressive value attached to it that was based on construction. Unfortunately, that's not real market value based on what people are actually going to, to do and pay. If it was going to be a casino, if it was going to be something along those lines, it made sense because that building could generate those kind of revenues to justify that higher. But without it, and really um, no means to get there, there have been several groups that have tried since then. Um, we're in the space now of what we do with it now. And I have somebody that is, I've worked with for the last five years, heavily involved in points racing. This is a huge glow. She's very involved in the community. She called me and she was bad. You know, and we talked quite a bit about it. And I, I just told her, I said, I have to do the best with what's available. And unfortunately, this is what's available. And all I can do now is make a commitment to the community that I will do everything in my power to make sure that the proceeds are invested wisely, responsibly, and in a way that would be an economic driver for our community. And that's really the best that I can do with the situation I I think a lot of us in this room uh, salute your, your financial plan because that's how Rotary operates. Uh, we, we save the corpus, we invest it and don't use it at all for three years and then rip off it. And that is amazing because, yes, you have money down the road when there could be an uh, even bigger need. But uh, I'm also interested in the traffic flow. I know that's one of, been one of the biggest attractions about having the 
fairgrounds there is that there's so much traffic on um, the highway at that particular spot. Now, having the entrance coming from Ringwood, is that going to take some of the traffic uh, pressures off of the main highway there? Yeah, the traffic flow is interesting. And I got to tell you, there's been plenty of times I've been thinking about something, something else and drove right past the fairgrounds and went, oh, I didn't even turn it all the way back around. So um, it is absolutely a consideration. When we were trying to reconfigure and go, how do we make this better? We knew we had to take some of the pressure off the of regular highway um, for a variety of reasons. What we're hoping to do is on that everyday traffic, absolutely move to Ringette, which will take a load off, but also work with the other entrances that we have. So when we have those larger events, instead of everybody trying to go out one exit, that we are sending people out Park Street, Elm Creek, you know, and Ringette, and it allows more um, ability for traffic to move faster and not be such a, such a cluster in that space. Um, traffic, you know, parking over in that space is something I've, I've, I've joked many a times going, parking for a hush, what is going on? Um, and, you know, I, I, I always uh, talk about a magic wand if I could find one, and I tell you, you have some really neat things happening. <laughs> but uh, it's a challenge, a couple times a year, it's a real, it's a real challenge for people in the community, and we are definitely trying to find ways to alleviate the different traffic flows so that we don't have just one in, entry and exit point, but we actually are utilizing all four. Speaking of traffic, I, went, I think the fourth bridge corridor is out in that area. Is the master plan still contemplating at that fourth bridge? May somebody and then get real off reality? I was here 17 years before we got a third bridge. <laughs> That fourth bridge has been a conversation since I've been here. Um, it's been really interesting once I saw the, the full map and overlay and how it really impacted the fairgrounds. It just can't be done as it's been originally designed. It wipes out the horse track, it wipes out soccer fields, it wipes out the whole side of the fairgrounds. And so um, I've had many conversations with different people within the city over the last few years about that fourth bridge, what the real What's the real skinny, right? Are you guys really going to try to do this? Are we going to have a conversation about this down the road? And really what is, they come back with is, you know what? We we got to get the water treatment plant done. Uh, we'll talk about that down the way. And they're going to be developing a new transportation plant. I think next year is when that's open. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's soon. And I know that the fourth bridge will be addressed at that point. So regarding the master plan, do you have like a timeline schedule for certain parts of it that you can share? And then I, I ask that because it's, we always generally get a year or two out trying to find projects we can be involved with. Um, yeah, so we, do, we devise the master plan to be five, three year, Phases and that first year was all about feasibility and really identifying the priority projects. Now the change in the horse racing piece kind of threw us a little bit because we of course have built that into our master plan, um, but we are working on some conceptual designs and we'll have more of a path forward. That now that we know where the funding's coming from. Here's a realistic view of time and when we can kind of go through and lay everything out. So I imagine that probably within 18 months, we'll have a very real, here's our path forward, and this is what it's going to look like. But we are, um, I'm just waiting on some conceptual designs right now for our first major capital project. We have lots of little ones that are happening all, all around, but our first uh, major capital project and then excuse me, project is actually a, a livestock farm. And that's going to be for our youth, uh, and making sure that they have an appropriate barn to show their animals and be involved. We do lots of clinics, lots of shows, and we want to make something a bit more year round. 
Uh, the facility that we have right now currently is in very, very poor shape. And um, we, we've got to get it replaced. And that's just kind of where we're at with that. And we want to make sure that our youth are taken care of first because they are the item of hurt. That's this is so to me though, is the YMCA in a similar situation where that building sits on the fairgrounds? And I think it's been really clear to me that that was um, the YMCA has been sitting there under the fairgrounds. So, do they rent from you, or when does any of that going to happen with the Flying Hook as well? So, the Flying Hook is purchasing, and so that will that land will become theirs. Uh, the YMCA is sitting on the fairgrounds. Interestingly enough, not a lot of people realize that and make that connection. A uh, very big priority and goal of the master plan is to create more of a campus atmosphere. So you get done working out of the one year, you happen to smell the amazing barbecue food truck over at the fairgrounds, you want to come over, walk through, you know, maybe the winter's grow market and really create a space where once you're on the fairgrounds, you have access to everything. And we don't have that right now. And so that is very much a priority of our master plan. Not to call you out of technology, but are you pretty certain that the money for the sale is going to be for the fairgrounds and county commissioners are going to go over that? Is that fairly soon? I've lost a lot of sleep over that question. <laughs> uh, as certain as I can be. I feel very confident um, the last year, the priorities and the goals, uh, not only the county commissioners, but the fair board alone. And you know, really with the creation of the ordinance and the permanent fund, it gives it a space as secure as possibly can be, which requires the approval, any movement of that money beyond the interest requires the approval of the fair board as well as the board of commissioners. And that will allow me to kind of prevent any one board from going rogue on me. I have one more question, if you don't mind, just because she's so patient with everything. He asked it. Oh, okay. Thank you, though. Thank you. Yes, I said thank you so much. Thank you, Jane Rob. I know you have a lot of responsibilities, so we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and get more questions. Okay, Sergeant at Arms today is Kelly Moody. Um, so we have 13 cards left to sell. Um, last chance. If anybody wants them, I'm going to put them. Okay. And as I'm walking back, the theme today is summertime, 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 summertime. Because once Memorial Day happens, that's what's next. Is it's going to be summertime? And if any of you have ever been educators, you understand that in a classroom, you're done. <laughs> yeah, might as well end right now because learning is done. Um, so I thought I would give a few quotes today about summer. First one being spring is a tough act to follow. So Mother Nature created June, which I think is appropriate. And then a few uh, people you may recognize their names. In summer, the song sings itself, William Carlos Williams. One must maintain a little bit of summer even in the middle of winter. Henry David Thoreau. I love this guy because he's got his language is always short, was always short to the point and kind of brutal. In early June, the world of leaf and blade and flowers explode, and every sunset is different. John Steinbeck. I am more myself in the garden than anywhere else on earth. That's Dave Moody, my husband. <laughs> and probably many of you out there. Some of the best memories are made in flip-flops. That's pretty much everyone, right? <laughs> and 
the best love stories are written during summer nights. I like this one. A perfect summer day is when the sun is shining, the breeze is blowing, the birds are singing, and the lawnmower is broken. <laughs> yep. Helen Keller, I loved what she said. Think about her. Couldn't see, couldn't hear, but she could feel. Keep your face to the sunshine and you will never see the shadows. Isn't that a good one? But last, I leave you with summertime, the time when parents realize how underpaid teachers are. Thank you, true. And with that, let's go to sad, happy, whatever, but anybody have some? Oh, I see the hands go up. Nobody's happy or sad. I just back visiting family in Ohio last week, and we are all getting older, no question, but everybody's doing well. And I don't know, you know, one thing about Ohio, Cincinnati is where I'm from, it is so green. I had forgotten that there are forests and parks and green lawns everywhere, and they don't need to irrigate because it rains a lot. I have a happy birth because Ray and I just got back from visiting a lot of my family in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Unfortunately, they were all dead. <laughs> so what I was doing was going to cemeteries where my great grandparents, my great great grandparents, and my great 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 grandparents and related relatives are. And when we were we were in Cincinnati too, but we were in Cincinnati. Arkansas, which is a small, unincorporated town in Washington County. We had a great time. Well, okay, you hear five out of five jobs. Uh, how I ended up being anticipating this for a while, but my youngest son got to change in the US to do his internship. And I said, finally, because the first little flight, and it was like taking from a little earth, that's a little bit of a study, it's in place to go wrong. Well, that one was really. This is the notion that there is you can spend the night there and then you end up having to go to Istanbul instead of how you're supposed to get there. And yeah, it took like two and a half days, but you know, finally we got there and managed to get things like 22 because I would be done. I'm a convenience. Well, oh. I'll throw in a happy book. I got to reconnect with a friend from college this morning, chat with her on Zoom, and it was nice to see her. So I have happy bucks myself, 10 happy bucks. My husband's birthday was a couple of days ago, but we started celebrating last weekend, and my youngest daughter and her guy uh, flew in from Houston unscathed. And uh, my oldest daughter, Anna, and her husband drove down. So we all celebrated together. Um, and then after that, my Leah, my youngest, and her guy, Bennett, um, we took off for the coast. What a wonderful time. And we, another couple was with us, and we just had a great time. And it was so funny because Bennett had never been to the Pacific Northwest. I mean, he was hugging trees. Yeah. I'm serious. He was hugging trees. He got into the Pacific Ocean. Um, yeah, he was doing everything that we think of that's kind of crazy now, but oh, he was loving it. I've got a couple of happy, happy bucks. Or did it, Maria? It's your birthday, did it? Oh. <laughs> Get your exercise. I have five happy bucks. Um, some of them are for last Saturday's experience with Boatnik. There are a couple of others in this room that were involved with that float and saw the excited kids when they got their books handed to them. It was just delightful. And what a great plan to keep giving away whatever the decorations are on the float until you're done. By the time I think we got to the end, there wasn't much left other than a few pieces of crepe paper. 
Um, the other is, this is a happy book for Doug Walker. I was at a meeting this morning in Medford and we were talking about um, mental health issues in children. Much of what we heard last week were um, uh, repeated today. And one of the questions was asked is how many people in the room know what ACEs is? And most of the people raised their hand. And I was thinking to myself, if they asked that question at my rotary, everybody raised their hand. And Doug, I think you started this back with the book, The Boy That Was Raised as a Dog. And so um, that has been a this has been a, a game changer for so many kids across our country. So good on you. That's a great. Do you know while we really kind of talk about ACEs? I think that kind of uh, tag right on. Well, uh, talking about floats in Memorial Day weekend, I got to go down um, the river on Sunday. Where is it? Where's the happy spot? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Oh, okay. There were eight of us. It was supposed to be nine. Uh, old wooden um, boats made by Pritchard and some of the other ancient people here. Well, ancient times. Anyway, these boats um, weighed only two or three of them, my son. So he kind of put together this historic float, and we're going to do it again next year. And so it was just great fun. And floating in a wooden boat is real different than floating on a raft. You don't really get that wet. <laughs> All right, looks like it might be time for us to pick a card. Uh, so where's the deck? Can you give us? Thank you. Tamara, would you do the question of honors? Jack at speeds. All right, next time. All right, and with that, thank you, Kelly. Well done, Kelly. I love someone too. We're about to wrap it up, and you know, Monday is Memorial Day, and I thought we should have our own little memorial in terms of Memorial Day. So I found a poem. It's a beautiful poem by uh, John McCray um, in Flanders Fields. I'm sure you've all heard it. It's sad, but it's also beautiful. So I'd like to share it. In Flanders Fields, the poppies glow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, stares heard among the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, love, inward love, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, compelling hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thanks, everybody.